Hey folks, today we're going to talk about monotonicity, or what it means for a function to be increasing or decreasing. So suppose we have some function f, and we're thinking about it, um, the values of f on some set of arguments s, and we notice that the graph basically moves up as we move from left to right with an s. So we might want to say that this graph is increasing. It seems to be a pretty good description of what's happening here. And of course, we'd have a mirror image sort of definition with decreasing if we thought that the graph was falling as you moved from left to right. So this video is going to be all about putting details into these ideas. So we basically want to make these definitions, but we have to make them precise because that's the point of mathematics. And in this video, we're actually just going to talk about definitions and what they mean exactly and how you might use those definitions when you're discussing functions. We're not going to do any problems and we're not going to do any proofs. So this is all about getting to know these definitions. So first, let's talk about strictly increasing. So suppose the function f has domain d and s is some subset of arguments in the domain. So right off the bat, we want the option to focus our attention to some subset of the domain. We don't necessarily want to talk about the behavior on the whole domain. We want to be able to identify certain collections of arguments on which we're going to describe the behavior of f. So now we'll say that f is strictly increasing on s if and only if for every x, y, and s it is true that x less than y implies f of x is less than f of y. So this is uh, perhaps a surprisingly complicated definition for such an easy notion we had a moment ago, but through experience you'll see that you really need to pin down what you mean when you say a function is increasing. And right now I'll just point out that this definition has to do with comparing all possible values of pairs of arguments in S. And basically this, this definition captures the idea that as you move from left to right within S, the values need to increase. Pretty sensible. So let's just look at an example. So here is the logarithm function and its domain is the open interval from 0 to infinity. And in this example we're going to let s be the entire domain actually and we claim the logarithm function is strictly increasing on 0 to infinity since it is true that for all x and y in this set whenever x is less than y and you look at the function values what happens is ln of x is less than ln of y. And so this definition is satisfied. x less than y implies ln of x is less than ln of y. And this is true for all the x and y that you choose from the open interval from 0 to infinity. And that's what we mean when we say the logarithm function is strictly increasing on this set. Now, clearly the definition for decreasing can't be all that different. So if we want a definition of strictly decreasing, then of course, um, we really only need to change one tiny detail, and it's right here, critical detail, but we're going to demand that f of x is greater than f of y. In other words, whenever you choose arguments within s that move from left to right, the value needs to go down. So let's look at an example here. This is going to be the reciprocal function defined on um, the sort of punctured real interval. So we've got all the reals got to throw away zero, you can't reciprocate zero, so that's our domain. So first we're going to isolate the set, the open interval from zero to infinity. We're going to let s be this set, and we claim that the reciprocal function is strictly decreasing on this set, from zero, this interval from zero to infinity, since it is true that whenever you choose x less than y, it is the case that 1 over x is greater than 1 over y, and that satisfies our definition. So the reciprocal function is strictly decreasing on the open interval from 0 to infinity. Now we could also choose s to be, say, the set negative infinity to 0 open interval. Once again, we claim the reciprocal function is strictly decreasing on this set, since it is true that whenever you choose arguments x and y, x less than y, it is the case that 1 over x is greater than 1 over, I, 1 over y. So the reciprocal function is strictly decreasing on this open interval as well. Now, this might be surprising. So let's let s be the whole domain. It's the union of the two intervals we were just looking at a moment ago. So the question here is, is the reciprocal function strictly decreasing on its domain? The answer is no. 
This might be surprising, but all you need to do is notice that if you were to choose x to be less than zero and y to be greater than zero, you'd have a situation where x is less than y, but one over x is also less than one over y. In other words, we found locations on the graph where as we move from left to right in this set s, the function value actually goes up, and that is not consistent with the definition. So we're not allowed to say that this is strictly decreasing on the domain. One lesson to take away from this is that the property of being increasing or decreasing has to do with the behavior of the values of a function on a set of arguments. You can't just have the one or the other. You really need them both together before you can say whether something's increasing or decreasing. So let's look at a pretty strange example. This is the function 2x minus the greatest integer function. We don't need to get into the details. What you really just need to know is that the graph looks like this. It's a very strange graph. It's a collection of uh, segments. Some of the uh, endpoints are open, some are closed. But here's our graph, and, and we can just use this graph to, to illustrate the ideas we've been talking about. So here are just a few of the things we could say about g. These are true statements about g. So if you were to select out the interval from 0 to 1, then you could assert that g is strictly decreasing on that interval. You could isolate out the interval from 1 to 2, and g is strictly decreasing on that interval. But now if you took the union, so if you're going to look at the interval from 0 to 2, then you can no longer say g is strictly decreasing. g is not strictly decreasing on 0 to 2, because you can find arguments within this interval for which the function value goes up. To be precise, you can, you know, 0 0.5 is less than 1.5, and yet g of 0 0.5 is less than g of 1.5. So that violates the condition of being strictly decreasing. So we're not allowed to assert this. It's just not true. Now, you can isolate out the subset of the domain, just the integers. You can just look at the integers, and you'll notice that actually g is strictly increasing on that set. So it might be surprising, but this function is, is sort of so strange, we're, so, we're not used to this kind of behavior, but um, because that behavior is there, and because the definition of increasing and decreasing is what it is, you can say these things that sound mutually sort of, they sound contradictory, right? How can a function be strictly decreasing here and strictly increasing there? And, but it is what it is, these are the definitions and you have to carefully work them through. Now, there are weak versions of what we just described, so let's talk about the weak versions of increasing and decreasing. So we say that f is weakly increasing, respectively weakly decreasing on the set s, if and only if for all x and y and s, x less than y implies f of x less than or equal to f of y. And of course, the respective definition for decreasing. And you notice the only difference between what we just did is we've now allowed for equality. These are no longer strict inequalities, they, they allow for equality, and the weak versions of these definitions are less restrictive than the strict versions, which thankfully that's true. I mean, the language would sound pretty weird if that weren't the case. The language suggests that, and it is true. And what we're allowing now is the possibility that a function remains constant. So here's an example. F is weakly increasing on the interval from A to B. However, it's constant here on this subinterval, and so we can't claim that it's strictly increasing on the interval from A to B, because it doesn't make progress as you move from left to right. It doesn't, the value doesn't actually go up. It stays the same, but it doesn't go up. So weakly increasing, we're okay, but strictly increasing doesn't work. So if you like, weakly increasing can be thought of as strictly increasing with the option of being constant on parts of your set. Now, one last comment before I move on. Um, truly, functions that are truly weakly increasing, that they actually stay level for a while, they're actually pretty rare. You don't, you don't usually sort of see them popping up in nature, so to speak. You actually have to rig them um, to, to, to study them. However, it turns out that having this definition is quite convenient in many cases. So. For now, don't get too caught up in worrying about having to perpetually deal with the difference between weakly increasing and 
uh, strictly increasing because in practice, a lot of the functions you'll see will exhibit strict behavior, not, not the actual weak behavior. But it is true that if you are strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, you're automatically weakly increasing or weakly decreasing. All right, so here's some warnings. You have to be aware of inconsistent definitions. So for some authors, if you use the unmodified term increasing, well, what they really mean by that when they use such a term, it stands for what we've just defined to be strictly increasing. Unfortunately, other authors use the unmodified term increasing to stand for what we have called weakly increasing. This is um, really unfortunate that, that a sort of common standard hasn't been universally decided. However, it, it's usually not that bad of a problem because if you're reading a book, you can look it up in the index. There should be a location where the definition is specified. If you're having a discussion, you and the participants in the discussion should just make sure you understand what you mean. There are inconsistent standards for these definitions. However, in any kind of uh, context where you're discussing this or reading, you should be able to resolve it and, and you, really, you really should be resolve it before you move on. And here's another warning. So you have to be aware of ambiguity. So it's ambiguous to say in either the weak or the strong sense, F is increasing or F is decreasing without indicating the underlying set on which the behavior is supposed to occur. I mean, we just said a moment ago that these notions really depend on both the function and the set. Now, what happens if you run across this ambiguity? Well, perhaps the set was actually described, but you just didn't catch it. So maybe you, in your conversation, you missed it. You might want to back up and ask what's going on, or maybe you have to turn the page back a little while or scroll up the screen and the definition will be there, or, or the set, I should say, is there. Um, another possibility is that for some reason, the set is supposed to be understood from the context. So perhaps you've been looking at an example where the underlying set is the interval from one to five, and it's been that way for several pages. And, and so it's supposed to be assumed that you're still looking at that. That's another possibility. Another strong possibility is that what is meant is that uh, the function has this behavior on all of its domain. This is often something you might do when you refer to a function as being either increasing or decreasing. You're really thinking of, of that statement as applying to throughout its domain. So that's one other possibility to be aware of. Now, having given you these warnings, I should point out that ambiguity actually can be convenient, believe it or not. So sometimes neither the strict weak distinction nor the underlying set affects the discussion. In such cases, the ambiguous terms increasing functions and decreasing functions are often used because it's less tedious to say or write, and it can be reasonably inferred how to understand what's being claimed in specific contexts. So it's a dicey thing, but um, sometimes ambiguity is convenient and it, and it doesn't actually detract from the discussion because when you fill in the details, you can figure out what is meant. So we're gonna get the, into that in just a moment. We're gonna talk about monotonicity now. So monotonicity is a fancy word that covers two options. So here's this ambiguity I talked about a moment ago. Suppose you were to heap all the increasing functions in one box and decreasing functions in another. And of course, I'm being ambiguous, but you, you'd have, you know, in a specific context, you'd say, okay, strictly increasing functions on this interval or whatever. But I'm just going to be ambiguous, increasing functions, decreasing functions. And the point is that if you want to talk about both of them together, then you're going to refer to the collection of monotonic functions. So monotonic functions are functions that are either increasing or decreasing. So you might think, well, these are opposite ideas. Why would you want to put them together? Yes, they're opposite, but they also share a lot of properties. They, they, be, they have mathematical properties that are quite similar. So there are many cases in which you want to refer to both of them together. And it's just too tedious to say functions that are either increasing or decreasing. So you can just say monotonic. So the monotonic functions are, are the collection of the increasing and decreasing functions together. Monotonic comes from a Greek root, which means unwavering. So you can sort of get a sense of where this comes from. And of course, we could modify this. So what, what would I mean by strictly monotonic functions? Well, you're talking about either strictly increasing functions or strictly decreasing functions. What would I mean by weakly monotonic functions? I would mean either weakly increasing functions or weakly decreasing functions. So let's just end this video by examining the function sine x and 
saying several things about it. So we could concentrate on the closed interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we could assert that f is increasing on this interval. And you could rightly say, well, wait a minute, what do you mean? You're being ambiguous here. Uh, weak? Strong? What do you mean? Well, okay. So f is, in fact, strictly increasing on that interval. What about weakly? Well, maybe I didn't want to say that because actually, because it's strictly increasing, it's automatically weakly increasing. So that's sort of implicit. So you can imagine where you get to the point where you might say something like f is increasing on this interval without going to the trouble of saying all the modifiers like strict and therefore weakly because you're having a conversation and everyone in the conversation sort of knows what you're saying. There are analogous statements you could make if you restrict your attention to the interval from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, where you swap out increasing for decreasing and you have exactly the same collection of statements. Here's something that can trip up students when they first learn these definitions. So f is indeed strictly increasing on the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, closed interval. And f is strictly decreasing on the interval from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, closed interval. You might be wondering, what about pi over 2? It seems to be caught as an endpoint of both of these intervals. Isn't it a contradiction? How can an argument lie in an interval where you're claiming strictly increasing behavior and also an interval where you're claiming strictly decreasing behavior? Isn't that a problem? And in fact, it's not if you unravel these definitions, because on the one hand, the increasing statement on the left requires only that you compare the value of f of pi over 2 with other values at arguments in the interval to the left of pi over 2. And similarly, this assertion over here only requires that you compare this to arguments to the right of pi over 2. So none of those comparisons are actually conflicting with each other. It's as though standing at pi over 2, when you look one direction, you can say one thing, and then you turn 180 degrees around and look at the other direction, you can say something that's equally true. But you don't have to do both at the same time. So there's really no contradiction. Both of these statements are, in fact, true. And you should sort of get used to this idea that it could be an endpoint of two different intervals where the function behavior is sort of strictly increasing on one and strictly decreasing on the other. And now we'll notice that uh, if we think about this behavior of the function on its domain, so we're going to think about uh, sine on the real axis. So on its domain, the sine function is, well, what can we say? We notice that by choosing these arguments, you move left to right and, and the function value goes up. So clearly this function is not decreasing on the whole real axis. And similarly, you can choose a pair of arguments where you move left to right and the function value goes down. So we can't claim that the sine function is increasing on this interval. So it's neither increasing nor decreasing. So we could say f is not monotonic. Now imagine someone walking into this conversation and you say f is not monotonic. And you say, well, what do you mean? What set are you talking about? So here's a case where you might be saying, oh, I mean f is not monotonic on its domain. And then someone walks into the room and says, wait, what does monotonic mean? And you say, oh, monotonic. Okay, so f is neither increasing nor decreasing on its domain. And now yet one more person walks into the room and says, wait, I just learned about weak and strong or, or, or weak and strict. What are you talking about? Okay, f is neither increasing nor decreasing in either the weak or strict sense on its domain. Now, you can perhaps see why we tolerate ambiguity in our discussions because these specific um, ways of describing the situation get more and more cumbersome as you demand more and more explicit articulation. Indeed, that's why we have definitions. That's why we have the definition of monotonic, so we can collect together two ideas at once and not have to say them explicitly. So despite the fact that math is at heart all about explicit statements, no ambiguity at all, it turns out because humans communicate with each other in certain ways through their writing and their speaking, that ambiguity is actually convenient or else you might spin your wheels and not really get anywhere interesting because you're perpetually having to unravel all the details of what you're trying to say. So there's a certain tolerance you should have to ambiguity. It can actually be good to make the conversation go faster and get to more interesting places. Just be aware that at any point, anybody involved in a conversation about math needs to be able to dig right down to the heart of it and explain which definitions they're using, what exactly they mean. There does have to be specific uh, explicit statements under the hood, but 
there's there's a certain kind of ambiguity that is perfectly reasonable when you're trying to move forward with with your mathematical discussions.